It is so good to be back at my normal bench. It's fun doing the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo. It's the one job I've kept on. I've had to let go of most of my other work because I was caring for my mother so long over here in the Isle of Man. And it's the one job that I just couldn't let go because I enjoy working with the guys on it too much. They're just, it's like working with friends, it's enjoyable. It's just one of those jobs. So here I am back at the bench, and things may sound slightly different. They may look slightly different. I've stopped using the Moto G4. I succumbed to the temptation of getting a Moto G6. It's probably the last Moto I'm going to get because it's not delivering the goods. It's partly because it's the Moto G6 Play. Now, the reason I got the Moto G6 Play is because the image sensor is a larger resolution than the other ones. And I thought that's going to work better for zoom, although, you know what, it kind of zooms, it zooms really in quite a lot, but unfortunately loses a lot of uh, detail at the end because it actually zooms in a lot further than the old uh, Moto G4 used to zoom in that's got a wider range there. It zooms right into the point it goes all a bit grainy. Oh, well, not to worry, I could always just stop before I reach that point. However, this has inspired me. Today I made an impulse purchase. I ordered a proper professional camera. OK, I ordered it from a shady seller. We'll discuss that if it doesn't turn up. We'll see what happens. It's a, It was, seemed like a legitimate site on the internet. Then uh, It's got very mixed reviews. Some people saying, oh, they're great, they're fine. And other people saying, I wasn't having the service. Well, doesn't that just about sum up every site? But we'll see what happens. It turns out it's an American seller that ships to the UK, but uh, with express delivery. So we'll see what happens. I'll give you a clue about the camera. The true aficionados will probably be able to work out what camera I've chosen. It's uh, a DSLR, but except it's mirrorless. It doesn't have that mirror that flips down, which I've never really worked out why people would want that in this day and age of digital cameras, because as long as you've got a good viewfinder or a large screen to look at that, you're going to see what the image sensor is seeing anyway. It's very boxy and chunky. It's quite compact, uh, and it just looks like a a functional mechanical component. And it's made by a prominent brand and has extremely good autofocus, which theoretically means that I won't have to shout focus you fuck at it like my bro from YouTube in Canada with his errant camera. But we'll see. I'm saying these things. Maybe it will turn out and it'll be absolutely crap. But we'll find out when it gets here. However, moving on to the subject in hand is these cute cute little lamps. These are just so special. This was such a treat to arrive back to. I'd seen these before. They, they use them in ultraviolet footwear sanitizers. They use them in washing machines, tumble drawers, anywhere you want a small quantity of UVC, which is the harmful ultraviolet that is germicidal. And the listing for these lamps... Uh, Rather unfortunately, it describes them as ultraviolet black light. No, just don't use the word black light because black light suggests it's disco lamps, and these things most certainly aren't. Well, if you plug them, if you manage to get their unusually large thread into a standard socket, they'll definitely be a loud disco lamp in the sense of a loud bang and a flash. It would be like a one shot strobe. They're not designed for 240 or 120 volts. They're actually designed for, well, it says in the specs here, it says. Uh, power 3 watts, voltage 10 volts, and working current 0.1 amp. Now, those of you who are mathematically inclined and electrically inclined will know that doesn't actually work. Because if it's 3 watts and the voltage is 10 volts, which it turns out it is, that's about 300 milliamps. So I'm not sure where the 100 milliamps come from. And these things are very, very interesting. If you look very closely at them, I've completely lost that one I had. Oh, but, oh, there it is. It's in the box. OK. If you look very close at them, actually, and I was going to zoom in, I could just show you the photo I took earlier. That's a much better idea, isn't it? So here we have the lamp with this little device. I thought, is that a getter? But I don't think it is a getter. Uh, let's zoom in. Let's zoom in up close and take a look at this lamp. So there's a little thing there. It's a little square panel. I think it's an Amer a mercury amalgam holder. Uh, it's a material that holds a little portion of mercury. Now, notice the filaments here are actually kind of frosted at the end. I reckon that's a thermal electron emitter. Is it a thermionic emitter? It's a, it's a thermally emissive material commonly found in fluorescent tubes. And fluorescent tubes got a wee filament like this at each end. 
And they call them hot cathode tubes because they run hot. And when this material is hot, it emits electrons and it lowers the voltage drop to the gas in the tube. If you turn on a, a fluorescent tube, you'll see it glows orange at both ends briefly and then it goes pink and it lights up. This is the traditional uh, fluorescent tube. And what's actually happening there is that initially the power, uh, the current is flowing through the electrodes here, as it does in this one. Uh, and it brings them up to a high temperature. This starts emitting electrons, and then it breaks the circuit. And if these are hot enough, if they're emitting enough electrons, it breaks the voltage down so that the tube can strike and run across standard mains voltage, 120 volt, 240 volt with a ballast and series to limit the current. Usually 90 volts across this traditional fluorescent tube. In here is different because they've got the electrodes coming up here, and then they've got one continuous filament, but it's just got the thermally emissious, emissious? Yes, it's got the thermally emissious, I just made that word up, emissious electrode bits at the end. And what happens is when you turn this on initially, uh, it's cold. So this uh, heating element heats up and once it reaches a temperature, this becomes emissive, the discharge, the ultraviolet discharge occurs around these, the mercury vapour discharge I'm guessing that's also the reason this little panel is here next to the heater, effectively, because the filament will heat that, it will liberate the mercury into the lamp. It's probably just a convenient way of doing it. I wonder if these electrodes, these flat electrodes, it must be, that, that they're coated with emissive material as well, so they may actually become a primary emitter and virtually shunt the voltage down low enough that this uh, element doesn't actually pass too much current, though it will still contribute to keeping it hot. It's very, very odd. I've never come across a lamp quite like this before, um, and I can show you this working, but I should also mention that it was a bit of a learning experience that has involved a lot of experimenting. You see, although it says it operates at 10 volts, it doesn't quite. When it's lit, it's 10 volts across it at the rated current uh, because of the discharge, but when you actually power it up, it has to be higher than 10 volts, and I turned it up to about ooh, 17 volts on my DC supply with current limiting before it actually would uh, light, and when it did, because it was a DC supply, only one electrode lit. To power this, I've actually used a little Christmas light transformer. Now, it's also interesting to note that after lots of experimentation with resistors, uh, I found someone's website, they'd also come across the exact same problem. I'll provide a link to it down below. It's a guy called Russell, and he had gone through exactly what I'd gone through, but he'd come to the conclusion that using a capacitor in series was a better alternative to the resistors, and you could then use it across the mains. In reality, I don't, I don't agree with that, and I'll tell you why in a moment. I'll just doodle something down. But anyway... What we have here is a couple of resistors, 82 ohm resistors. They're the closest two in parallel to get the power rating and the uh, the current limiting required for this. And in reality, this little power supply is not rated for the 300 milliamps. It's only rated for about half that, but it does its best. So what I'm going to do now to show you this operating, I'm going to zoom right down on it. It's going to go a bit sort of fuzzy because I'm going to zoom in far too much. Hold on, there we go, let's zoom in far too much. I'm going to hold the lamp here, this is probably a bad idea. I'm going to turn this lamp, this light off, and then it's going to do its best. Oh, look at that, that's quite a good uh, sparkly effect from the uh, light. Right. Okay, here we go, here we go. So it's warming up, it's glowing, and suddenly it's got its discharge established. Right, okay, I'm going to turn light back on again. My apologies, it's going to be bright. Oh, no. So there's the lamp running. And what happened there when you saw it start was, initially, the filaments glowed. I have to remember this is UVC. I shouldn't be poking my fingers too close to it. It is only 10 volts across this. I can put my fingers across, absolutely safe. Uh, it's more harmful in this area because it is putting out UVC, but not a... Oh, yes, it is actually putting out quite a lot. Anyway... <laughs> Uh, what actually happened there was that when I powered it up, the heater, the filament glowed, you saw it glowing orange, and then the, the discharge started because it reached that point that the electrons were emitting and it dropped the forward voltage. If it didn't do that, the voltage drop across those electrodes, if it was just two bits of wire, would be about 100 volts and it just wouldn't work. So, uh, 
Theoretically, round about, as Russell also worked out, the ideal resistor on 24 volts to go up to that higher voltage that it's actually going to heat it up quite quickly and then it's going to conduct and clamp down, uh, 40 ohms is typically a good idea. In this case, I've got uh, the nearest resistor as I came to. I tried lots of groups of 150 ohm resistors in parallel initially, just gradually increasing it. And if the current is too low, it kind of, one side starts glowing and then it's unstable and then it goes dark again. Then it brightens again because it's the current is modulating between the discharge and the filament inside. So it's quite a critical. You need the correct amount of current. In this case, it wasn't quite operating right because... Oh, hold on. You know, I can go one step further. I can stick a meter across this. I can show what happens. Here is my little cheapy dinky meter. This is AC. No quite crisp display. Uh, let's put one connection on here. Let's put one connection on there. So this is now across the lamp. Watch what happens. The voltage will initially start off a bit higher than 10 volts and then it will clamp down. So it's gone up to about 13.5 volts. It's warming up. The discharge has occurred. It's gone down to about 10 volts. And that's why you need the resistor in series. If you didn't have the resistor, if you stuck it straight across, straight across 16 volts, that once it was uh, formed a discharge, it would uh, cause problems. It would try to pass too much current. And that is a slight problem with using a capacitor. Unfortunately, if you look on the eBay listings, I don't know if this is traditionally what they do or if they've just seen this guy's page and said, oh, that's great, we can supply a capacitor with it. Here's what actually happens. If you were to monitor the voltage across that on this sine wave, then on each half cycle, it would reach, say, keep in mind this is only a 24-volt supply, so it's probably, but well, it's not even going to reach 24 volts. It's going to reach just above 10 volts before it strikes. I'd say, let's say roughly 15 volts on each half cycle, and then it strikes. So it goes up to about 15 volts, and then the discharge, uh, which it's extinguished because it's alternating between each side, the what actually happens, it's like a neon lamp. With a neon lamp, uh, if you have this little classic neon lamp with the two electrodes inside, and what happens when you put a resistor in series that across the mains is the voltage across it goes up to about 100 volts, and that's when it strikes across, and then it drops down to about 60 volts, a holding voltage. It's going to be different here. It, I think it goes up to about 15 volts and then drops down to about 10 volts. This is where I should have cracked out the oscilloscope. Uh, not a good time to do it now. Maybe I shall do that later. That would be quite interesting in hindsight. Yeah, OK. And I've got a new bench through in the other room that does facilitate using things like oscilloscopes. At the moment, uh, fitting an oscilloscope under this camera doesn't really work that well. Uh, but the other uh, bench is more suited to that. So that's very likely. Uh, so 10 volts. Let's say it starts 15, drops down to 10. That's just a rough guess. What actually happens if you use a capacitor in series with a glow discharge lamp like that, what would happen is that uh, the voltage rises, the lamp strikes, and then suddenly it goes from the 50 volts down to 10 volts. It's only about a 5 volt drop, but that charge across the capacitor of that 5 volts results in a sudden zap, a sudden current spike goes through it, and it causes what's called sputtering. Now, sputtering, if you were to connect capacitor in series with a, a neon lamp, it would blacken very quickly. The whole case would become this metallic sheen. And what's actually happening there is that because of the sudden current pulse that's way above the current rating of the electrodes, you get, uh, it sputters metal off and it basically coats inside the lamp. So I'd be suspicious that if you just stuck a capacitor in series of this, it's going to actually create a sort of metallic film around the outside. I've not tried this. It's speculation. The one way you could avoid that is to add another resistor in series that was like not going to limit the current, not going to limit current enough that's going to dissipate a lot of heat, but is going to do it enough that it will limit the actual spike to some lower level that's less likely to cause sputtering or at least lower the sort of rate of it. In reality, my choice for running this lamp would be to use an isolation transformer and a resistor in series with the lamp.
Uh, I'm drawing a discharge lamp. Theoretically, it's much more complex than that. It's actually a discharge lamp with a filament across it. It's a very intriguing lamp. Um, I haven't noticed, I've not been running them long enough though, and it's not very high power. I haven't really noticed a strong smell of ozone. And this is interesting in its own right because some of the lamps uh, are rated, they actually say uh, low ozone. Um, and I wonder if that's down to the type of glass user coating on it that limits the wavelengths that are coming out to the germicidal effect versus the uh, area where it actually starts splitting the oxygen apart to allow it to recombine to create the ozone. I don't know. I'm going to have to maybe run this for a while and then sniff it. But, uh, very, very interesting lamp. I'm really surprised at the cost of those lamps. I wonder how long they'll last. Uh, £1.42 is ridiculously cheap for the sort of technology and the novelty of this lamp. So, a uh, very interesting lamp. If you do decide to buy one, the name of the lamp is GTL3. I shall actually provide a link down below uh, for the uh, a generic eBay search to find these lamps. That's the best bet. So I'll provide a link to Russell's uh, page where he covered his experiment with these. I'll provide a link to an eBay listing and uh, that should cover just about everything and the name of the lamp itself, GTL3. There's other types as well. It's very interesting. There's one other thing before I finish here. <coughs> the one other thing indeed. Let's measure the base because it certainly did not fit into a standard small Edison screw holder. Absolutely no way. So uh, let's zoom this out, close it down. 16 millimetres diameter for that. So it's an E16 or E17 holder. Yeah, I may have to have a look around for those. I know I noticed some sellers were selling this sort of electronic ballasts for 12 volts and, and the capacitors for the 240 volt, but they were also selling the lamp holders that are specifically designed for these. They're very functional looking, very clearly designed to mount inside equipment, but very interesting lamp, fascinating little lamp indeed.